Hi, everybody, and welcome to our sixth live show in the lockdown. Still got to start by just saying a big hi and a big thanks to everybody out there on the front line doing what they can. The charity raisers, the workers, so many stories beginning to filter through of people being affected by the virus. Thoughts are definitely with Robert Schwartzman, who's lost his father. Uh, and I was just chatting just a few days ago to a friend of mine racing Formula 3 who has spent three weeks suffering from the virus. Uh, keep his name quiet at the moment, but uh, so pleased that he's managed to pull through that one. But there are so many others who aren't and thoughts as ever always with them. This is a show that we're doing during this lockdown period. We may continue in some form or another once things start to ease off a little bit, but it's definitely a way to try to see if we can bring the motorsport community together with some chat uh, about the sport that we love. And so here we go. Uh, first matter of moment, I guess, is the fact that the British and maybe the Austrian Formula One circuits, maybe the best way to describe it, may hold races behind closed doors. There is a proposal, perhaps to have two races in Austria and then two at Silverstone. That's kind of adopting the thought that I expressed immediately uh, after the announcement of the cancellation of the Australian Grand Prix, which was that I think this is a moment for Formula One to consolidate and to try to put on more races at one venue in order to cut down the cost and the carbon footprint of traveling all over the world for one race uh, in various different continents. And I think that definitely is the future. That to me is much more important to be looking at that on a long-term basis than budget caps. That's kind of a different subject though. But uh, anyway, interesting to see that that idea is being considered for a start. Secondly, the closed door element of Formula One. I think it's, you know, it would be a really weird thing, wouldn't it? I can't imagine what Bernie Eccleston would think about a closed door race. Well, he would think, actually, I know exactly what he would think. He'd think, well, that's what we should have been having over the last 20 years. His business model for Formula One, or 30 years, his business model for Formula One is Formula One takes all the money because it costs a fortune to put on a Formula One race and it costs a fortune to build the cars in, a, in order to put on the Formula One race. And his business model always was, just as a little bit like there are enough wealthy fathers out there to pay for their sons to do F3 and F2, by and large, that will keep those two championships alive. In the same way, Bernie always felt that there were enough countries out there that could justify writing off enough money per year in order to be part of the Formula One calendar and to build a super circuit if necessary to be a part of it. And that proved to be true. Astonishingly, it proved to be true. Now we're still in that kind of business model. Liberty have inherited it all. They've tried to make changes. They found it very difficult to take any bricks out of the wall surrounding the Bernie business model, but they've tried. And now they're at the position of saying to say Silverstone, well, we'll put on a British Grand Prix behind closed doors. Silverstone would logically reply, we now make a little bit of money out of the British Grand Prix, not a fortune, but we make a little bit. If you take away our one source of revenue, a little bit of hospitality as well, but mainly uh, the gate, the attendance on the day, it's going to cost us a fortune. And I'm sure that's the case with Austria as well, or indeed any other circuit. And so... And that's because Formula One takes all the rights. It takes the television rights, it takes all the travel concessions, all the all the stuff that uh, we know about. Advertising on the circuit, title sponsorship, all goes to the Formula One kitty. So how would these circuits make money? How would they stop losing money? Well, it would only happen if Liberty then underwrote the loss of those races. Now, I know Liberty are a really, really cash rich, wealthy company, and they probably are able to shrug off such losses, but they've already had to do that. Loss of revenue, China, all the Grand Prix that have been cancelled already effectively adds up to loss of revenue. If they now start compounding that with underwriting the cost of staging closed door Grand Prix, it's going to be exponential really in terms of the amount of money that's going to go out the window. Of course, it's a good thing for Formula One to be out there, to be on television, but it'll be interesting to see how Liberty now balance importance of keeping their investment alive by having something at least, i.e. a Formula One championship for this year, against the amount of money it's going to cost to do that. Um, probably money will win because, as I say, they are massively cash rich. Having said that, um, everybody has a limit. Every company has a limit of some sort or another. Generally, I think this is only my opinion, but chatting to people I know in the motor racing business, August, September is a more realistic time 
to be thinking about restarting everything, even if it is behind closed doors, because of course, from a health and safety and a governmental restriction point of view, putting on a race as early as June raises huge issues in terms of people working closely together. And in Formula One, and particularly putting on a Grand Prix, you can't get away from that. Whether it's the teams, whether it's marshals at the track, no media, by the way, but marshals at the track, whether it's all the suppliers, I mentioned this last week, the Pirellis, the electronics, the the engine manufacturers, the brakes, all these companies will be building parts and making parts and working towards these dates if they're definitely going to happen. And that will be a complication in itself. So it's an interesting one. Um, we need to watch this space, obviously. I think also, you know, I've always, you know, this thing about fake news has been, uh, we know what fake news, where it all started, basically. Uh, the phrase was coined originally. We know where that all came from. But I was staggered to see fake news coming into Formula One at a reporting level very recently. One of the top team principles, I said, sorry, rephrase that. One of the team principles of one of the teams, Otmar Stefanauer of Racing Point, was quoted recently. And I just say this has to be fake news because I can't believe he would have said this, that he thinks the Australian Grand Prix could have been run. And I find that absolutely astonishing because in reality, Formula One should be saying, we were absolutely crazy to let it get that far. We should have canceled that race two weeks before. And for a relatively senior member of Formula One now to be saying at a time when at least one, if not two or three of the personnel in the pit lane had tested positive, that that race could have been held. I'm speechless. I can only assume that it was fake news and he was misquoted or quoted out of context or the usual old thing. Um, okay, moving on from that, there might be some repercussions. We'll uh, hear what you've got to say about that. Um, I'm just going to my phone now to make sure I've got my live chat open here. You're lots of questions coming in. First of all, again, thanks everybody for your very, very kind comments. It's getting to be ridiculous how nice everybody is um, on the comments you make on the YouTube channel. I'm enjoying this just as much as you are. That's about all I can say. And thank you very much indeed for all the positive words. Um, I want to just put in a little uh, push now for a book that's just been published called Take Risk, exclamation mark, good title, I think, by Richard Noble, the man behind the, well, all the speed, land speed record uh, attempts on the British side over the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years. Amazing man who believed passionately in land speed record breaking, water too probably, if you got hold of it all. Um, and he's done a book now. And of course, his his thrust SSC still, still owns the world land speed record. I think it's 600, 763 miles an hour. Can that be right? Yes, I think it's 763. And so he still holds the record. It breaks my heart to know that Bloodhound, um, in its attempt to try to do 1,000 miles an hour, probably isn't going to happen for financial reasons because the amount of planning and work that went into that, just a superb program. And it's done a lot already for education. Anyway, don't miss this book. I think it's a great book. And uh, here's the front cover now. You can see take risk. There's Richard Noble. It's out on hardcover. It's out on Kindle. It's out on audiobooks. And it reminds me actually of one of the best books I've ever written. I've ever, I've ever written. I've never written a book. One of the best books I've ever read, which is recommended to me by um, somebody who worked for the Benetton team. It's called Angle of Attack. Uh, actually, it was Bob Bell. Okay, not dropping a name there, but Bob, one of the top de designers for Benetton, said, you've got to read this book, Peter. It's brilliant. Anyway, it was. It was, it was a book by a guy called um, Harrison Storms, who ran the North American program in the build up to the Apollo program and all the problems they had to get through to convince NASA to go this way or that way. And... Um, so it's that sort of book that Richard Noble has written, all the obstacles that he had to, the, the hoops he had to jump through in order to get the support he needed to do what he wanted to do. And I love that sort of book, the book that goes into the background and and go, and go touches upon the, the problems and how you overcome them rather than just the record attempt itself. So there you are, that book. Um, Another thing now, we've been talking a lot about um, online racing, and I see there's more and more of it now. Every time one opens one's inbox, you get more emails. Uh, the BRDC are doing one now. It should be really good. Sim, it's, that's in conjunction with iZone. 
Um, so lots to talk about that. I did take the trouble to look at Lando Norris doing the IndyCar race at Cota. And in fairness to Lando, I should congratulate him for the camera that he does have on Twitch um, over his footwell area. And thank you to the readers who pointed out about the Twitch. The problem, of course, is that it isn't great quality imaging and it's quite difficult to see all the details. But there is a footwell camera for Lando. So when you can, when you're watching this, maybe go to his channel to watch it and you'll see some of his footwork. You don't get a very good view of his handwork and armwork, but you get definitely get to see the footwork quite well because it's a vertical shot, sort of shot you'd never get in real life in a real racing car. And just two comments to make about that. One is um, incredibly good release of the brake pedal pressure at Cota, particularly going into the hairpin and some other corners as well, just beautifully gradual pedal pressure release. There was none of this getting onto the throttle as soon as possible and getting out of the brakes as soon as possible. And I'm not talking about throttle brake overlap here. I'm just talking about the way he's releasing the brake pedal pressure. Watch that for Lando. And that is one of the reasons Lando is very, very good. When we talk about suppleness and we talk about soft edging, that is a very good example. And it's a bit graphic and it's probably a bit basic and it's probably not really the true picture at all, but it does give you a feel for what you can do in the footwell area. Having said that, it was interesting following the lap of Lando at Cota as he goes starts to go into the quick S's, about halfway through the quick S's, which is a really spectacular, interesting part of Cota. He, he's on about two thirds throttle and then he gives it about half pedal brake pressure against throttle just to balance the car in the middle of the S's there, pretty high speed. And this is all on the simulator, got to keep reminding everybody about that. So Lando does, do throttle brake overlap in some corners. So I think, because we've seen it there. And I'm still, I think in my case, my jury, if I have such a thing, is still out about whether that is the purest of all ways to drive. And I'd like to play for you now just a very short chat I did with Rob Wilson about this very subject quite a while ago now, I think it was 2014. Um, and it begins with me asking Rob about the importance of footwork and then I take the conversation to his reaction to and what he thinks about throttle brake overlap. In other words, left foot braking against throttle. I'm not talking about left foot braking per se, but left foot braking when you've got some throttle in place. And this is how the conversation went. You drive it with your feet as much as your hands. I think we go back and thank Frank Matic in Australia yeah. for that, that line in 1964. Yeah. Um, so, and it's so true uh, is that, that you drive it with your feet. And so get on the throttle a little bit more. If then it's still going to hit the inside or there, well, then you can stop turning or even turn away. But you want to, want to try and make adjusting the steering the last of the things, because if you can keep turning it, you keep ramping up this little twist in the car there. Is coming out of the brake pedal pressure on its own at the right rate the same as doing that against throttle? Doing it against it, you mean yes. having the brake Have and the throttle on together? Yeah, overlap and using the brake brakes against the throttle. You could in the true it. pentiauricular left foot braking. Oh yeah, well, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, well there's, there are periods in races where there is a gap between the two. You don't have to be on one and on the other as well. There'll be times when you could use it to maybe fix a mistake or, or certainly sometimes with the left foot braking on a really fast oval type corner just to steady the car perhaps you can do that but you are you are pushing both ends of the car against the middle in doing that and so yes you could become world champion by doing it it depends how well the other guy's not doing or not doing that and doing something else so you could say yes you could do that you could win the world championship with three wheels you know if you were if you're racing against um, uh, the right sort of people Interesting. Eh? I love that phrase. You're pushing both ends of the car against the middle. And that's kind of what you're doing. That's why I say it lacks purity in what you're trying to create. <laughs> I don't know if you actually picked up what Rob said at the end. I said, you know, is it, I, I didn't say, is it okay? But he was saying you could be world champion by doing that, but it kind of depends what the others are not doing in order to be world champion and that you could win the world championship with three wheels. Depends what everybody else is doing. So in other words, he's not a great fan. And, and I suppose if you are pushing both ends of the car against the middle, the solution not to do that 
is to be pure with your throttle and or coming out of the throttle and or brake applications. And so the car is either doing one thing or the other and not both simultaneously. I mean, I'm sure there are many drivers and engineers who would say, well, a lot of old rubbish, but that's interestingly enough, that's that's a point of view that I know Rubens Barrichello would share for what it's worth. That's why he never really wanted to go to left foot braking. Um, and look at all the drivers that drove that way before left foot braking was ever de rigueur as it is now. You can't even get a car with uh, that would enable you to right foot brake. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. I'd love to go into more detail about that. We'd need decent footage and I'd need to go down that path in a lot more um, realistic way. Anyway, let's get on to some of your comments. Thank you very much uh, for all of these. Um, first one out of the block was uh, Jeremy G before we even started. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Um, Brian McPeters, hello. Hi, thanks for your videos. Great. We've got some videos coming up, so don't go away. Um, Diesel Lackius, you're a big fan of Hamilton and Mansell, but who do you prefer the most? Well, I don't know. I prefer, you know, this 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 brings to mind actually a lot of a lot of what's I think not that pleasant about motor racing today. That if if I say on Twitter in a, in a very short thing, I say a beautiful pass by Lewis or something like that. All the Ferrari fans or the Red Bull fans or the Max fans say, oh, yeah, well, this or that and that. You can't be objective anymore, it seems. And, and social media has made all these different areas very, very obvious in your face now. So you, it's very difficult to be objective um, without having to say, yeah, I'm a fan of this driver. I'm a fan of that driver. I don't like this driver. I don't like that. I mean, they're both completely different, aren't they? Nigel and Lewis, completely different animals. What all I would say was that I think, I think Nigel, you know, you got to remember Nigel Mansell raced from 1980 in Formula One, and it wasn't until mid 1985 that he had, for the first time in his life, a race-winning car underneath him. And I can't think of any other Formula great Formula One driver. So let's say a driver is one more than 30 races who's ever had to wait that long for the world to think he's good enough to justify giving him a decent car. He spent all that time proving to the world that he could do it, and eventually the world listened. And it was just sheer determination that got him that far. And no wonder by the time he got there, he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder about life and about motor racing in general. And that's kind of why Nigel is the way he is. If you look at an Alan Prost and an Senna, uh, any of these guys, Lewis Hamilton for sure, they were all rated when they were 16, 17 years old. And, and it was pretty clear at any given moment of their careers that they're always going to be in a very good racing car. Perhaps not Ayrton because of what he had to go through in Formula in Ford 2000 uh, in order to get his Formula 3 break. But from Formula 3 onwards, it was pretty clear that Ayrton could, you know, drive for a number of teams uh, and name his price, really. But that was never the case with Nigel. So I think that was what makes Nigel Mansell so different from everybody else, that he had to, had to convince people through nothing other than just raw determination that he could do it. And of course, when they did give him a good car, it became relatively easy for him. And he had no compunction at all about taking on the Keke Rosbergs or the Nelson PKs or any of these guys or at the center in a different team and racing him just absolutely fair and square. So if I had to, you know, if I if I was in the trenches and we had to jump out together, I'd want Nigel Mansell next to me, I think. And that's all I can say in answer to that question. Um, right, let's have another one. Um, uh, sorry, because it keeps flicking. I have to keep going back to the right page. Here we are. Uh, let's talk about Ferrari's agreement with the FIA. This is some Thai kicks. Uh, yeah, we can. I kind of said everything I wanted to say about that last week in that I think Ferrari are bigger than Formula One, bigger than the FIA. And I think that we've always known that. Bernie's always known that. That's why he's structured Formula One the way he has for so many years. And if we want to come up with rules that we know are going to annoy Ferrari, like budget cap, then we have to be ready for Ferrari to say, we don't like this and we're going to take this action or we may not race at all. And there's no point in, I think, then saying, oh, well, you know, we're bigger than Ferrari because we're not. You know, without Ferrari, we wouldn't have Formula One as we know it, as it would be successful. So there's no point in coming up with rules that are going to antagonize them to that extent and just put them in a corner where they've got no option. That's what I'm saying. Of course, you can do other things, tech regs or whatever, but we're talking about giving them no option 
other than to accept a much smaller budget than the one they want to run to. And, and so I think we should be looking at a much more global way of reducing costs in Formula One, not budget caps for the teams. I think we should be looking at, as I say, reducing the carbon footprint, reducing the amount of travel the teams do, get rid of the motorhomes, and certainly make the midfield much cheaper for the teams to operate in with a Dallara type car, maybe Ferrari engine to keep Ferrari happy, um, that enables that to become much cheaper. And that, that would be the way I would do it. To me, budget cap can only end in tears. And it's not because of Ferrari, it's because it's a flawed way of trying to reduce costs, artificial ways, a bit like DRS, I think, <laughs> ludicrous. Um, oh, here's something, I've got my picture, but now the, the questions have come up over my picture. That's pretty cool, I didn't know how I did that. But anyway, I'm a bit of a dunce when it comes to this. Um, any reflections on good to Steiner's management technique, re his drive to survive antics? Is this common for team principles? Well, not having watched, not being a Netflix guy and not having watched it, I can't really comment. All I can say is I think Gunter's pretty good. You know, I like Gunter a lot. Um, I met him first in North Carolina when he was, and he still is, I think, still, still running a really good carbon composite company there. And um, there's a great coffee shop called The Summit very near to his race shop. And I used to hang out there and uh, when we were doing all the USF1 stuff and got to know Got to know him then, really, and uh, he's just a good guy. A um, bit like Franz Tost, isn't he? I'm sure he's fairly emotional and, you know, says what he thinks, but equally, I think he's got a fairly good racing brain, I can see. And I think he's done a good thing for Pietro Fittipaldi. He met Pietro at the summit as well, and they just got chatting, and he looked at his CV and realised he's pretty good and gave him an opportunity. It doesn't happen very often. Nice to hear. So, yeah, I'm a bit of a fan there. There's one other question that's come in. Uh, it's, this one's come in on WhatsApp, so it's a little bit more cumbersome for me to get to, but I'm going to do it now. It's from uh, Horatio Fitzsimmon, who's a very quick young driver trying to make it in the in the junior ranks. And he it's a long question, so I'll paraphrase it. He just says, um, uh, he's looking at all the classic films and reading the books. He's struck by the lack of prize money in motorsport today. And is there any, do you think there's any way at some level, junior formula F4, F3, F2, would ever ent entertain the idea of prize money, given it would attract more talent from around the world? Well, I don't, th I don't think it'll ever happen, sadly, Horatio, because uh, motor racing is capital intensive. You need all the money up front in order to pay the teams to go racing. And so that kind of, that's, that's where the money goes. So there's none left for prize money at all. And, and the reason you have to pay the money up front is that the teams themselves can't raise any money. We're talking about the junior ranks because of the way the sport is structured. They get very little television time, very little platform on which to advertise their wares. And so it behoves the team owners of all these teams, whether you're Prima or whether you're Double R or High Tech or whatever, to look for drivers who can generate money. And so long as that's the case, sadly, we're never going to get into the era of prize money again. As much as it would be a healthy thing, and as much as it would be nice to see, I don't think it'll happen. Having said all of that, perhaps now's the time to expound one of my um, dreams, which is, and it, it actually is an article I wrote for F1 Racing Magazine. I think it was in 2000. I think it was a, it was something to do for the, uh, for the new millennium. It was a fiction article. Um, but basically my idea was, and this is for Formula One, we're talking about other ways of making Formula One interesting and more exciting without doing all the stupid things they're trying to do at the moment. And it was that every the drivers no longer sign a year or two or three year contract with a the team. They are properties that are wonderful. They're promoted and they're very talented, but the drivers can only do six races a year for one team. And you can't do more than, you can't do two, two races in succession. I think that was the formula I came up with. And before every race on the Thursday night, there is a massive global auction and you have the team owners bidding for the services of these drivers. And they can bid, obviously, whatever money they can get hold of through sponsorship or whatever. Uh, and they have to plan where, where they want to go with drivers. And that that auction in itself would become unbelievable television in the same way that, for those that know anything about cricket, the IPL auction is a huge thing. It's almost bigger than the uh, tournament itself. 
And then, um, you know, then you end up with a Sergio Perez in a Mercedes for a race and a Lance Stroll in a Ferrari. And then you've got Max Verstappen in a Williams. Uh, you know it's going to happen at some point. Better for the teams because they can go out and say, look, you know, we are Williams. We're going to have Max. We're going to have Lewis driving for us at some point. I think that would be absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm sure it will never happen because the teams would say, oh, but in order to get the best from the driver, we need to share all the technology with them over a long period of time. It's an investment that we make. So therefore, we'd have to, we wouldn't have to—we would be able to give any, uh, any information to any of the drivers that would be impossible to do. Well, I say that's rubbish because how often do we, I mean, Gene Carlo Fisichella jumped from a Force India straight into a Ferrari, did he not? Um, and he didn't have to go through three years of university in order to understand how to drive the car. And drivers get into new cars when they switch teams and they go out, they do a lap time straight away. You know, you could do it. You could actually come up with limits on what you're allowed to talk about and what you're not. And I think, you know, this would solve all the problems. You wouldn't have any more chat about reverse grid races or trying to make the races shorter. It would just be brilliant. But anyway, it'll never happen. I'm, that, I only say, I only, I'm only saying all of that because it comes to if we did that, then I think that would affect the lower categories as well and how everybody as well as and the way everybody makes money or tries to raise money. I think that would change the face of motorsport and that would possibly enable us to go back into the into some sort of prize money era. So bring it on. I'm interested to know what everybody thinks about that. Um, and in my my fictitious novel, I think at that point, Alex Wurtz was the president of the FIA from memory. I think I had somebody else quite cool in another strong position. I can't remember. You could have Toto in as the head of Liberty or whatever, running the world. So that would be good. Um, <laughs> here we are. Uh, thanks for your videos. Yeah, well, thank thank AP Archive for the videos. It's a lot of fun working with them and going through them and looking for stuff that hasn't been out there very much or mute stuff and trying to make it live again. That's um, that's really uh, what this is all about. Do I have any thoughts on this? Is from Ed Vickery. Do I have any thoughts on Zach Brown's rejection of the idea of the teams buying stock chassis and racing them at reduced cost? Well, I didn't know that he had, but uh, I'm not surprised because anybody who's in Formula One with the inside the wall, the barricades of Formula One, and they've got their team or they're running their team and they're doing their thing, they will always be negative about changing that and allowing high tech or Prima or ART to buy a Dallara and come in and blow them away, aren't they? So they're always going to be negative. So why would you even, why would anybody even think about asking Zach Brown what he thought of it? Because we know what the answer is. No point in doing that. Um, so I'm not surprised. And if it's going to happen, it would only happen the way I'm suggesting. It would only happen if autocratically Liberty stroke the FIA had the bravery to say, this is what's going to happen. Take it or leave it. But of course, they wouldn't do that. Um, uh, it feels like the teams are getting a little upset about it. Well, of course they are. The teams that are inside Formula One are always going to reject any concept of anything new that might make their slice of the cake smaller. So don't even talk to them, would be my answer. Will Liberty change the direction of Formula One? What effect will Penske's purchase of Indy have on Formula One? Well, yeah, I mean, Roger will only do good stuff. He's just a top man, isn't he? He's brilliant in every way. I wish he'd been president of the US for a long time. But no, I'm not. I'm not. I wish he hadn't, because then we would have missed him in motorsport. Um, and yeah, I'm sure he'll he'll come up with some great stuff, and he will he will make IndyCar bigger and better, and the Indy 500 will become bigger and better than it is, and it's big and brilliant already. Which brings me to a nice segue, because um, we've also had a question from the dreaded Jimmy Roberts, who tries to ask really difficult questions every week about, um, well, it was based on Katie Moss um, and Nassau and Sterling and Katie, uh, Sterling and Susie and Nassau, and Sterling's love of Nassau, and the Nassau Speed Week. And could we have more information, please, about the Nassau Speed Week? Well, the Nassau Speed Week was just one of these gems of time, a perfect moment in time in the mid 50s through to the late 60s, when people wanted to do things like put on motor racing in Nassau, Bahamas. It was a brilliant thing. It started in 54 on an old airfield circuit in the Bahamas called Windsor Field, no relation. Uh, and then they staged, I think they staged the first race at another circuit called uh, Oaks Field, named after Henry Oaks, who was a big player in uh, Bahamas at that time. Sadly, passed away at a young age, the wheel of a Sunbeam Alpine 
I think en route to the airport in the Bahamas, but those sorts of things happened, didn't they, back then? And the Sunbeam Alpine, very similar to the car that James Bond drives in uh, Sean Connery in Dr. No up the hill there. Beautiful little car. Anyway, getting back to the point, um, it was then held at this other circuit, Oaks Field, which was quite a long circuit and had um, lots of shrubbery around the, on the edges. It was, it, it, although there were no trees or ravines or rocks, it wasn't a great place to go off because you you were always going to hit something. And there, there was a very bad accident there in, I'm saying 65, 66, when a young Venezuelan with a very nice Ferrari lost it, went off, took forever for a, I don't think a fire truck ever got there, or if it did, there was a hole in the hose and the water spurted out of the side of the hose. And anyway, he died six weeks later, sadly. Uh, and the following year, I think was the last year they held it, 67. But there were also some fabulous moments, as you can imagine. And, and it, it worked so well back then because the Formula One teams and the big American teams had got right to the end of their championship. In the case of Formula One, it was, well, once they started the US Grand Prix, it was an easy thing to go from uh, Riverside or wherever over to the Bahamas or Sebring, over to the Bahamas and do the Bahamas Speed Week. And if you've been racing a sports car down in Venezuela, you could go up to the Bahamas, and there was always going to be a bit of a break before the new season started in January, February, March, March. And so it was a great thing. Later on, of course, it um, when the Can-Am series grew in importance, prize money, there was less, uh, it was less attractive to go to the Bahamas afterwards. Uh, it was costly to do, and it, the prize money was going to be nothing like as big as it was with Johnson Wax behind the Can-Am and various other bits and then commitments to racing other where the Tasman series came on. But, um, you know, if you, apart from Jim Clark, who never raced there, virtually everybody else did. And Jochen Rint won a Formula V. The Formula V was huge at Nassau in the back end of the 60s. Um, I love Formula V. I grew up with it in Australia. It was, it was our sort of Formula Renault. And... Drivers like Chris Amon, Bruce McLaren, Jochen Rint, Sam Posey all did the Formula, e, Formula V race. In the case of Chris, I think Chris won it, Bruce won it, Jochen won it, all in Formula Vs. And But there were also brilliant sports car races, factory involvement, and all the drivers that you could possibly romantically link with a golden era of 50s, 60s motorsport were all at NASA. And... It just had this thing about it. I mean, I, obviously, I never went there, but equally, um, I wish I had. And I think it's something, to, it's just something to cherish that we'll never see again. David McLaughlin, bless him, who works for the FIA now, does a lot of FIA work, I guess, on the historic side, safety side too, um, has tried to do a Bahamas revival, had tried. I think he's still ongoing. They're trying to do a new circuit there. But he got about as far as any human being could go into trying to recapture everything that was great about Nassau. And um, but you know it was it it would, it would never be what it what it was. Uh, but think about Alfonso de, de Portago in the mid fifties coming to Nassau with two Ferraris to do. There were usually eight eight races over the eight or nine races in the, no it's more than that, sixteen seventeen races over the course of a week. Ladies races, locals races, big sports car races, Formula Junior, Formula V, the whole thing, short sprints, longer races, pit stop races. And um, so Roger, uh, so Alfonso de Portago would come as a classic Nassau racer. <laughs> and in 56, I think it was, 57, he brought, um, he brought a mate of his who was a New York fashion photographer to take pictures of him uh, racing and have fun, as you do in the, in the Bahamas, and let him race, race his other Ferrari. The guy promptly went off, put it into a hedge and shunted it badly. And, and Fons was in the same race. And when he saw this, he was so shocked that he went off as well on the same corner. Stories like that are legend. Um, so, yeah, you name it, they were there. And and, and the reason um, I'm, the segue is there is we were talking about Roger Penske and his purchase of IndyCar and the Indy Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Well, here's a video, courtesy of David McLaughlin. It's the only one that we could find. This isn't actually an AP one. So it's a Bahamas tourist board video of the 62 rendition of the Speed Week. And... Um, I think I think we got some audio. It's 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 with uh, it's a narration is like 
So they welcomed them to the Bahamas as she cruised in. They unloaded the priceless machinery. I think it'll be there in the background. So I, I'll, maybe I'll talk over it or maybe I won't. It's not very long. But the point is that in 62, the 250 GTO Ferrari had hit the road as the next Ferrari that people could buy. And there were five of them that year in the Bahamas. Roger Penske was in the Mekon car. Lorenzo Bandini was over to race that and a Dino 268. Uh, SP and Innes Island was in one, you know, and so it went on. Anyway, Roger won the big race and he won it as a race driver driving for John Mecom Jr., the Texan oil millionaire in the Mecom GTO. Anyway, let's have, let's have a look at the video and there'll be a few more stories to tell after that. This is Nassau 62. That was a Ford uh, factory entry, actually, and it went very well in, in this main race, which was um, surprising. It got up to third at one point. Believe it or not, very quick on the straight. Dan Gurney would race that Lotus 23. Timmy Mayer's Cooper Monaco. Looks like a nice Lister, probably Corvette engine. Lotus 17 behind it. That's the Bandini uh, 268 SP Dino Ferrari. Lovely, lovely. And that where they all just drove downtown. Palm trees, middle of shopping. That's Sir Henry Oaks on the left. Poor chap. And here we see the start of the main race. This is the Nassau Trophy. Lots of cars. They had to make one pit stop. Very quick left-hander after the start under the bridge there, the SO bridge. There you see Roger in the Mekon 250 GTO. 21 is Bandini, Lorenzo. Still at early stages of his career, but what an amazing thing to have seen him in a 250 GTO around Nassau. Uh, just wonderful. More GTO action. You can see what I mean about the undergrowth. There were things there you didn't want to hit if you went off, and rocks and trun trunks and trees and so forth. There's Lorenzo again chasing Roger, who was just, you know, just as how good Roger Penske was. They're equal cars. Innes Island in there too. Very, very quick driver. Innes would win this same weekend in the Rosebud Texan Team Rosebud Lotus 19. But it was Roger who was um, he went on to win so many races at at Nassau at the Speed Week and drivers the Rodriguez brothers were brilliant there Jim Hall Lance Revenlo Peter Revson Sterling Peter Collins Phil Hill Pete Lovely won a lot of Formula Junior races Dan Gurney Jack Brabham Roy Salvadori John Cannon AJ Foy Joe Bonnier McLaren Rint and so it went on so the Checkers comes out for. Roger Penske, who looks dead cool as a racing driver. Um, just think this man is now running IndyCar, owns IndyCar. He's got his own team. I don't know how many races he's won. Uh, just Mr. Mr. Perfect, isn't he? Just wonderful, man. Just great. He's just won a race in the Mecom 250 and the liner disappears. Back to the mainland. I think in, um, in closing, the you know any any racing venue that includes nightclubs called Emerald Beach or Dirty Dicks or the Jungle Club or Barma Lounge or the Junkanoo Club deserves to be part of motor racing history and folklore and that's what we had at the Bahamas and I, I really recommend this, speaking of books as we did earlier Terry O'Neill's book on the Bahamas uh, Nassau Speed Weeks absolutely superb the research he's done he's got results of every race pictures from every year, definitely worth looking at. Okay, um, let's move on to some more questions, but thank you for that nice segue. Um, where are we at to? Uh, 
Um, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I, this is from Tim Henley. Also, I knew Katie Moss on NASA in the 50s and 60s. Great gal. Well, isn't that nice to hear? Thank you for that, Tim. Um, something here about me being reasonable journalist so i'm not going to read that one peter i read a peter i read according to the race that ferrari could do no could do another series like indycar or WEC if budget cap is reduced if they compete in another series in formula one where would you like to see them oh, i'd love to see them in america in indycar wouldn't that be brilliant indycar ferrari wonderful um but you know ferrari could do whatever they like and i, I know i've always used this analogy purely as an analogy, not as a real thing. But don't ever forget that if Ferrari wanted to do their own Formula One championship, independently of the FIA and Liberty, and they built, I don't know, let's say they built, took up my idea of having a circuit in North America, a circuit in, two circuits in Western Europe, a circuit in uh, England, and a circuit in Australasia, maybe two, one or two in the Middle East as well. Let's say they've got like five circuits where they can do a 20 race championship. And they came up with a formula to have everybody ran Ferrari engines. You could build and design your own car if you wanted. Um, and it was open to all people, all comers. And they did a deal with Disney for global television for 15 years, massive amount of money involved. And they started paying drivers like Lewis or Max to come across and do it and to drive a works Ferrari. Do you not think that would, would work? Of course it would. And that is, you know, that is something that none of the non-Ferrari people in racing ever grasp because they tend to think in the world in which they live that Formula One is the ultimate limit and anything beyond that is impossible. But of course it isn't. And Bernie always knew that what I've just said is feasible. And that is why he always operated the way he did in order to keep Formula One the way it was. And that is why now Ferrari are making noises about doing something else. And it's too much trouble to do what I just described. Obviously for Ferrari actually to do that, to own their own championship and to create that, they'd never do it, okay? Point taken. But they could very easily try to do that with Roger in, in IndyCar. You know, we shouldn't assume that they would not do that especially if he could persuade IndyCar to come over to Europe and do some races here, which wouldn't be very difficult because Roger's a racer if nothing else. Um, any, uh, Barry Cosgrave, any insights on Toto's future? Seems a bit of a mystery. I assume you mean Toto Wolff there, not Toto Rush or? Yeah, of course. Um, no, no idea, apart from the fact that I think he could do anything, couldn't he? He'd become Chancellor of Germany, uh, Austria, sorry. Um, he could become president of the FIA. He could run Liberty. He could continue to do what he's doing. He could take a holiday. He could do whatever he wants. So good luck to him. Good man. Um, and he deserves it, everything that he gets, I think. I think he always speaks sense. And he's a, as I say, he's a sort of European Roger in a way, I think. Um, right. Please write a book. Well, we went through that last week. Uh, yeah, not yet, but I might. Should, as is Ed Vickery, should Ferrari swap Vettel for Ricardo going into 2021? I know Seb's been crucial behind the scenes developing the car, but is Daniel quicker? Well, you know, that's another question, isn't it? I, I think that if you've got Charles Leclerc, it doesn't really matter too much who you got in the other car. Seb Vettel, um, do all right, providing he knows he's there, basically to be blown away by Charles, which of course, in Seb's case, his ego would never allow him to do. So he would be grumpy and cause problems and probably not the right guy to have in the other car. No, you need a guy, and I've said this before, you need Mick Schumacher in the other car. I, I'm a big Mick Schumacher fan. I'm not saying this to belittle him, but I don't think he's Charles Leclerc, uh, but I think he could do a very good job in support if they gave him a lot of test mileage and well, if he, as much test mileage as he can. And he was there, you know, able to get do things his own way organically at his own pace. And I think he could do a very good job. So he would be a perfect number two. I don't see why they would want to put Daniel in the car because they've got Charles. And as we've seen so many times in Formula One, if you've got a very special driver like a Lewis or a Michael or a Charles or a Max, you don't cramp their style by putting anybody in the other car who can potentially annoy them. And why would Ferrari do that? It doesn't make any sense to me. So, you know, I can see why, in a way, Red Bull may have thought that it was better to have somebody like Alex Albon in support of Max Verstappen rather than Daniel. But um, from Daniel's point of view, you know, he's got to just continue 
he made the decision to leave because he didn't like being number two to max in terms of treatment and equipment or whatever he thought. And so, you know, his, I don't know what to say about it, really. I think he made a mistake. I think, he, you know, as so long as Red Bull wanted him, I think he should have stayed because there's another factor here, and that is it's very difficult to find a really, really good race team, and Red Bull is one of them. And when you're there, it doesn't matter what's going on, you stay there and you make the best of it, especially if you're Daniel Ricciardo and you've got some great talents that actually in some areas are better than Max Verstappen's, and you could still win races with Max as your teammate. But he didn't, oddly, and it's a bit like, Rubens leaving Ferrari when he did, you know, to go and be number one somewhere. And then he got blown away by Jensen Button. What was the point of that? Anyway, um, that was so, yeah. To me, I'm not surprised Ferrari have offered Seb a fairly weak contract because why do they need to do anything else? You know, all this stuff about developing the car to me is rubbish because if it was all about that, why did Rubens or Massa not massively improve the Williams when they went there using all that knowledge they had? Of course, it's, you know, you want, a, you want a good driver. You want the best driver you can get within certain parameters. But ultimately, developing the car is all about having the quickest guy you can have on the limit all the time. And then the data is telling you exactly what you need to know. It's nothing to do with experience. It's nothing to do with... It's nothing to do with vocabulary even. It's just to do with data and setting up the car. And Charles gives them that in spades in the same way Lewis does at Mercedes and in the same way Max does at Red Bull. Once you've got those guys, you've got your development program sorted. That's my view anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, where are we? Um, a next question from Stuart Warby. Didn't Senna do something funny in the corner with the throttle? And no, he didn't. He didn't. He was... You know, he was a right foot braking guy, and he the only funny thing about Senna was that he had this weird throttle application thing where he had to had to jig the thread, very, very soft throttle return spring. So although he was moving the throttle a lot, it didn't have massive impact on on the actual car. But um, it I'm sorry, I've just lost the page again. It keeps flicking around. I don't know why that is. Um, the so he had these weird this thing about jabbing the throttle waiting for the right moment to get the power on that was that was the characteristic of Ayrton if he if he got if you had you were blindfolded and it was Calvin Fish driving the car in Ford 2000 or Ayrton Senna you could tell immediately which of the two was Ayrton Senna because of the way he used the throttle and that's what he always did and to me that was a slightly impure thing but it was what he liked doing and and that's what you know that's what made it work for him as rob said you know you can win world championships left foot braking against throttle uh depends what everybody else is doing um rob graham hey peter it's senna's death anniversary weekend well it is very sadly um we've seen lots of tributes to roland ratzenberger and we'll have a lot more to uh, to Ayrton tomorrow very sad very very sad day for us all and um i wrote a long article about it for the sunday times a while ago now giving all my reasons for um, the accident and why it happened. And the guy, one of the guys I feel really sorry for at this time always is um, Max Angelelli, because he was the driver of that ludicrous pace car, safety car, Opal cadet thing they had, Opal record it was, that he was forced to drive um, in the race. They should never have put the pace car out in the first place. They should have stopped the race and cleaned the grid from the first, from the start line accident. But they were desperate to show that Formula One could have a pace car in the same way they did at IndyCar because Nigel Mansell was over there getting higher TV ratings or, or helping the TV ratings. So they had to put out this safety car. Max did a couple of a couple of laps with it on the Thursday, came in and the brakes had boiled, the tires had gone off. He said, it's impossible. I can't drive this thing at any pace whatsoever. And that's the reason the tire pressures went down, the temperatures went out of the tires when Ayrton was behind Max on those on those laps. And it was the first flying lap with low tire pressures where he went over the bumps of Tamburello and went off and Michael in the Benetton, a much better car. Some say too good, um, was easy flat through, the, through those bumps. So, yeah, I won't say any more there. Terrible day, as indeed was um, the loss of Roland. Um, uh, did you ever beat Bernie at backgammon? <laughs> How much did you win? This is from Rob. Uh, I never, no, I didn't. And um, I always used to watch Bernie playing backgammon with James Hunt. And um, the fact that Bernie could win money from James put me off playing Bernie, I must say, because James was not stupid, much more intelligent than I am. Um, Ferrari will never win with an Italian management, says Jose Balbiani. Maybe, maybe with Flavio, but this is so looking like late 80s, early 90s way of doing things. Um, yeah, 
I don't know. Is it the Ferrari management? Um, what are we What are we saying there? The car's not very good. I think. Oh, Matthias doing quite a good job, isn't he? Um, the car's not a Mercedes, but it's not bad. We don't know what it's going to be like this year, do we? But the signs were not great, but they've had a bit of a hiatus to think about things. And they got Charles. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't be that disparaging about them, really. I don't think. Um, and let me, let's rephrase that. If I went to Ferrari tomorrow to run Ferrari, it's just before you make any criticism, one makes any criticism, also think, what would I do in those situations? What would I do? I think I would keep um, Mattia. I think I would. Um, but yeah, I would find a couple of engineers that I know from the UK area ish to go along and do some stuff. But I wouldn't change that much. I think they're doing all right, aren't they? I don't know. I think they are. I would listen to Charles as well, to be honest. I'd need to talk to Charles about what he thinks because he's got such a good brain. And maybe he should be running the whole team as well as driving for them. That's a the point. Um, Zabir Ahmad, seems like Sainz, Ricardo and Vettel are three drivers that could be in the Ferrari for 2021. I thought you were going to say that could be out of Formula One in 2021. Uh, well, no, well, we've gone through all that, you know. Um, of those three, I'd say Sainz would probably be the best guy alongside Charles. Um, but he's pretty reflexy. He'd probably do a bit of damage to the cars. So I would still go for somebody like Mick Schumacher. Um, strategy calls. Yeah, well, you got Jock Clear there. They don't listen to Jock very much. Very good point about Ferrari management. Jock Clear, when you got Jock, listen to him more and let him do more. Um, and I think that's one thing I would change if I did go there. In fact, I would probably promote him big time to some more senior management position. I think he's got a very good racing brain, Jock Clear. And he listens to people as well, which is very odd in a motor racing sense. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, all the money went away with tobacco. Yeah, well, all the money went away with tobacco, but all the money also went away with, um, to some extent, it's a bit of a double-edged sword here, with uh, pay television, because the viewing rate, the viewing figures now are so much lower than in the days of free-to-air television, like, I don't know, 70% less, that it's very difficult now for the teams to generate sponsorship in their own right because the viewing figures don't justify it. So it isn't just cigarette money. There's, there's still quite good sponsorship money out there. It's just that Formula One's um, prospectus isn't commensurate with other sports. They're saying, well, we want five times as much as this golf tournament wants in order to be for title sponsorship of this golf tournament, but we can only give you one fifth of, pub of the publicity you're going to get from golf. That's the problem, the team space, and um, let alone other sports, soccer or whatever. So um, yeah, it's not just it's not just the cigarette money. Um, Penske could easily run his motorsport operation and be the POTUS at the same time. It's not like the current guy is fully dedicated. Well, I don't want to get into politics here, but I take the point about multitasking Roger Penske, Superman, mega person. Um, yeah, yeah, he would be great. Uh, did you see that picture I tweeted on, uh, put out on Twitter this week, actually, of, of Sterling Moss wearing a Dan Gurney for president T-shirt and Dan Gurney with his arm around Sterling wearing a who do you think you are Sterling Moss T-shirt. Very, very nice. And then there's been other ones, Jim Clark for prime minister as well at the time, of course. Um, yes, I think he was talking to, I think Sydney Oaks in that picture, sorry, going back to Nassau, no, he's talking to uh, Red Crease, who was the um, CRISE, who was the, who was the man that ran the racing at Nassau. I didn't talk enough about that side of things. And Red Crease was, um, he's a good man. You know, he loved his racing, but he certainly ran things in a Bernie Ecclestone-ish way. And at every driver's briefing was famous for having a baseball bat in his hand just to, you know, keep the peace in case there were any people that disagreed with him, which, you know, not bad. Um, why isn't Watkins, this is Terry Mansfield, why isn't Watkins Glen ever mentioned in historic Grand Prix tracks, either present or past? Well, I mention them a lot. I've done quite a lot about the Glen on uh, on my channel over the years, and I love the Glen, everything about the Glen, and I'll do plenty more about the Glen, so keep tuned. Um, Terry O'Neill used quite a few photos of mine in his Speed Week book. I raced there in 61 in the residence race. Love this program, memories. Tim Henley, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. What a great message to say. Um, so you're saying that Ricardo to Ferrari would be a bit like Reutemann to Lotus and Williams? Um, well, quite sure what you mean by that. Are you saying that 
I mean, I don't think Ricardo is as good a driver as Carlos Reutemann, but that's because I grew up with Carlos and kind of managed him. So, um, so I don't think that parallel is there. In terms of uh, how Patrick Head reacted to Carlos coming to Williams and destabilizing Alan Jones, maybe you're right. Maybe you got a point. And I think I think Alan I think Patrick still thinks today that if he had had Clay Regazzoni and the other Williams in '81, Alan would have won the drivers' championship in '81. I think he probably believes that. Having said that, Patrick was the guy who also said it costs just as much money to run the second car as it does the first, so we must get the best possible driver we can get in the second car. And Carlos Reutemann is quantifiably a better driver than Clay Regazzoni. So I don't know if that helps at all. Uh, again, you know, if if I ever had the privilege of running a Formula One team, and I ever had the privilege of running a driver as good as a Lewis or a Carlos or a uh, Max Verstappen or a Charles, I would never compromise that by putting in a really quick, annoyingly quick driver in the other car. I'd always get a driver who was compatible and could could work with the number one in a nice way. But let the number one go to sleep at night knowing he wasn't going to get blown away um, the next day. Um, what's the best Formula One book you could recommend? Well, we've had this question before. I'm going to have to try and do something about all these books behind. Yeah, you know, I was looking through Jean-Pierre Beltoise's book the other day. It's a lovely book. It's a sort of photo album -y type book. And it's great. You know, he's just obviously he's just been shown photographs and, and just asked to talk about those photographs at various stages of his career. And it's in French and English. And it's just beautiful to read and makes me really miss Jean-Pierre. So there's the book of this week that I've got excited about. I suppose there are plenty more. Um, okay, I think it's time for our next um, video. Now this one, the, I, the, it's about a five minute video um, of the race and it ends with a checkered flag and then we're going to stop and then we're going to show another bit of video just after that and I'll explain why. But this is a video of the AP archive from the 78 South African Grand Prix at Kailami run in nice hot weather. It was an interesting, it was a fabulous, I was there, it was a fabulous weekend in so many ways. And to put it into context, Nicky uh, was just starting his first season with Brabham Alpha, having won the World Championship with Ferrari in 77. And he's just finding his feet in the Brabham Alpha, but he takes the pole here. And uh, I've got Ross Cheever on the phone, but I better ring him back later on. Ross Cheever, very, very quick driver. Um, so Ross, I'm just doing a live show at the moment, mate. I'll ring you back. Um, uh, yeah, very, very quick driver. We'll talk about Ross at some other point. He won't come on the show, I know that, but he's a really, really good guy, phoning from California. Um, anyway, going back to Nikki. So that was that. Um, McLaren had won the championship in 76, 77. It'd been a relatively difficult year, but James Hunt had driven well. 78, obviously his hopes were in the M26. And he was hoping that he'd have a good year. Um, but he was, he, he'd really matured as a driver and as a racing person. Ferrari were Carlos Reutemann and Gilles Villeneuve. And it was the first race for the T3, the new Ferrari T3. They were on Michelin tires. There was one Renault there, also on Michelin tires, driven by Jean-Pierre Jabouille. They'd made their debut in Formula One the year before. And um, Tyrrell had the new 008, very low chassis for Patrick Depaye and Didier Peroni. Patrick Depaye at his absolute peak of performance. And Jody Schechter was in the Wolf, which the year before, of course, had won its first race in Argentina and had then won at other circuits, Monaco. And um, he had really gelled with the team and looked like a potential champion. So they all came to Kailami where you do a lot of testing. And of course, it's high altitude and it's a long, long straight. So there was a lot of emphasis on top speed. And out of the blue, stage left came the new Arrows built in 90 days, I think it was. We now know kind of illegally, but at the time, nobody knew that. Tony Southgate's car with its um, incredible wings it had on the side, and it was generating more downforce, as much downforce as the Lotus 78. This was before the Lotus 79 had come out but did come out two races later. Um, and the Arrows was blindingly quick in South Africa. Patrese led, Ricardo Patrese led, I don't know, about 35 laps uh, before the engine went. But it was a great race. There was a lot of oil down at uh, Crowthorn, the first corner, the right-hander uh, from Nicky, had an engine go, had the Alpha engine go uh, from Rupert Keegan, who was in the 30s. He had an oil line, I think. 
Patrick Tambe started from the back of the grid. Clutch went, although he qualified fifth or something really quick, not not much behind James in the second McLaren, and he drove beautifully, but then went off on the oil. And Carlos Reutemann also went off on the oil down there, just hit the brakes, back end came out and went off into the catch fencing, got out of the car, and as he walked away, looked over his shoulder and saw the car erupt into flames. So didn't say much about the deformable structure of the car at the time. Uh, a couple of other little things before we start. I remember they had on race morning, they had a, um, for some reason, they had a Snoopy Beagle, massive, great Snoopy Beagle flying over the circuit. I think it was for one of the insurance companies and um, MetLife probably. And um, anyway, they were supposed to drop, this Beagle was supposed to be dropped from the balloon with a parachute over the circuit. And guess what parachute didn't open? And it landed, <laughs> I was talking to Gilles, and I remember talking to Gilles and literally this thing came down and smashed this, MGTC that was lined up with other MGTCs ready for the driver's parade and it was the one to be driven by Gilles. Uh, that was that was hilarious and, and I got really got to know Gilles for the first time at that race. I remember chatting to him at the Kalami Ranch for about 45 minutes about snowmobiling and former Atlantic and tri Riviere and he knew that I was pretty close to Carlos and I guess he was trying to get inside my brain and understand a bit about Carlos but equally that's when he and I really became pretty good friends, I've got to say, um, for the first time. And so got a lot of memories from that 78 South African Grand Prix. And more will come now as so we have a look at the video. So let's roll up part one of the 78 South African Grand Prix Kyle Army. So there's the circuit, a big, big crowd on race day, as you can see. This is uh, Brabham Alpha BD46, uh, beautiful Gordon Murray car. We're just starting up the flat 12 Alpha engine. It was a really quick package. There's Nicky getting ready. Behind him, Santi Gadini, who he took from Ferrari, and he's now basically there just as Nicky's mate, but he, ostensibly he was running the Parmalat side of things. John Watson goes out. There's Jody in the Wolf. Now, without Patrick Head, he's, he's obviously designed the Williams, left a year before, but it's a Harvey Postlethwaite car. That was Dave Luff strapping in Emerson, Kopasuka, and you saw the Ligier going out, the Brabham. There's Carlos leading the Ferraris out onto the circuit. Mario. And then Ronnie, you notice the inside shoulder of the left front is shaved away. That was because Ronnie kept blistering the tyres in practice, but that was to have a big impact in the race because he, he, his tyres lasted more than anybody else's. There's Tambe, who went, oh, sorry, there's James looking really good in the McLaren. Another shot of Jody in the Wolf. It was a beautiful car, that Wolf, beautiful livery, the whole thing. Jody was mega. Lafitte in the Ligier, there's Tambe going out in the other McLaren. Um, it's just a great energy about it. You can see the number of people in the pit lane and the way it was, shorts, Mario on the ground. Now, this was really funny because the grid was published with Mario on, on the right, even though he's P2 and Nicky was on the pole. And Nicky had chosen the right-hand side for the pole, but there's me, by the way. And the grid was incorrectly published. So Mario pulled up in Nicky's pole position and everybody got confused and nobody knew where to go on the grid. Of course, in the end, it got sorted and Nicky was able to start on the right. Interesting that he had chosen the right, is it not? Because today everybody goes on the clean side of the road, which is the left, but Nicky wanted the inside into Crowthorne. And there's the uh, Jabawi Renault Turbo. Jean-Pierre was a very, very nice guy. Look at the difference in eye openings between James's helmet. So there you go, Nicky's on the pole on the right, Mario on the left. Nicky in all the excitement, great start, but then managed to get fourth gear instead of second. By the time they get down to Crowthorne, He's uh, back to P3, Mario's leading, there he is, with Jody second, Nicky, James Hunt, Jabouid, Alan Jones, that was Carlos uh, going down the inside there, Gilles leading the midfield pack, there's Emerson in the Kopasuka. Lots of good drivers all up and down the field, that was uh, obviously going past the pits there. Big crowd, big South African crowd, love their Formula One, there's Mario. He was struggling on the straights and the tyres started to go off. This wasn't a great race for the Lotus 78. Colin Chapman never thought it would go well though. That's Crowthorne where all the oil was later dropped. Uh, and the race was um, really defined when Mario dropped back, Jody dropped out, Nicky's engine blew, and that let Patrick Depaye lead the race. In the, in the well, sorry, Ricardo Patrese then inherited the lead and was really quick. Looked like he was going to win it. His engine blew. James Hunt's just pulled out there with his engine gone. Doesn't look very happy, does he? Got all the crud all over his overalls. And now Emerson comes in to retire the Copper Suka. I think it was a drive shaft. There's Dave Luff, used to be at McLaren, running Copper Suka. Good man. Um, chatting to him at the Autosport show not so long ago. Very nice mm. guy. Um, yeah, Emerson doesn't look very happy, does he? There. And uh, there they are going past the pits. Anyway, Patrese stopped too with an engine, which then let 
Patrick Depaye lead the race. There's John Watson looking nice in the Brabham Alpha. <laughs> I can get to the end of this. Uh, and Patrick ran out of fuel on the last lap, and Ronnie got him on the last lap to win the race. Jabouille, Villeneuve, Lafitte, Tambe. Look at the sideways motoring there. It looks superb. It really miss that was Clubhouse Corner. Lovely corner at Carl Army. There's Carlos going in, floating in in the Ferrari. And there's Tambe hanging on well in the McLaren from the back of the grid, as I say, very underrated driver. He'd be a very good man to be a number two, not number two, but he's a good Ferrari driver, wasn't he? Replace Jill. There's Jody taking the lead from Mario. The crowd love that one. Jody in practice was a bit childish. The engine was misfiring. And at one point I remember him coming in to the wolf pit and just revving the blazers out of the thing just to let the mechanics know it was misfiring. And then wheel spinning out of the pit lane again. There's but look at Depaye there, a little bit sideways in the Tyrrell. There goes John Watson. There's uh, Brett Lunger leading a pack, and then finally Mario uh, is coming up to lap them. But Mario's now in trouble with his tyres, and also he's starting to run out of fuel as well. Overhead shot of Alan Jones in the beautiful FW06 Williams. I think that is. I think it's very difficult to tell, isn't it? But um, yeah, past the straight. Lovely circuit, Kyle. I mean, look at all the catch fencing they had. That was just, we just took it for granted. Catch fencing, catch fencing. There's Hector Aback in the Lotus 78, run by Ian Dawson, the former mechanic of Mario Andretti. Finally, the checkered flag comes out, and there's supposed to be Patrick Depaye, but Ronnie Peterson has passed him on the last lap. His tyre's in pretty good shape and takes the win. Patrick drives into the scrutineering area very quickly and obviously very annoyed. And there's Hector Aback, DDA Peroni in the other Tyrrell who finished sixth. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. It's all pretty breathless, quick stuff. But the reason I paused it there and we've got a little bit more to show is because this video, unlike many of the others that uh, we're, we're looking at, actually includes a little bit of an interview with Ronnie and Patrick Depaye after the race. Now I have to kind of make apologies for the line of questioning because in the first interview, which is with Ronnie, the interviewer says something like, um, but what about Jody Schechter? You must feel so sorry for him. And Ronnie just says, well, he was behind anyway when he stopped, <laughs> which is a good answer, rather silly question. And then, um, you know, Ronnie, and he says there was a lot going on, it was a hard race, and he's talking about the oil, so that's that. And then Patrick Depaille, he's just lost the race because he's run out of fuel on the last lap. The guy says, how was the race? Was it a hard race, Patrick? And he sort of looked at him what are you talking about? And that he does say at the end, no, but the car was very good. And you just get a little bit of a feel for how Patrick and Ronnie were and what it was like to talk to them. So let's run this, this very short second vid. condition with a uh, lot of oil on the track which cost some driver uh, some, some driver the race of course no yes. fucking rep camp. Yeah. 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 Was it a difficult race? Yes. No, it was quite easy. It was, uh, it was a very hot day. Did yes. that affect you? Yeah. No, 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 not really. Number four, six. No. And the car? The car was perfect. Really? Yeah. Thank you. Lovely shots there after the race. Um, it just I wanted to talk about who's in the background there as well. When they're interviewing Ronnie, you see Rex Hart and Bobby Clark, his two mechanics. And Rex Hart, of course, is the father of Lee Hart, who was Lewis Hamilton's mechanic for many years at McLaren. He's still at McLaren, still on the race team. Good man, as of course is Rex. And in the background, when they're talking to Patrick Depaye, you see walking past uh, Alex Blignort, who used to race. He was in he raced in a South African Grand Prix, I think certainly a Rand Grand Prix in the mid 60s, but he was the organizer of the South African Grand Prix. And then behind him with a moustache, you see Ian Dawson, the mechanic I mentioned, who was at Team Lotus. And then at that point, he was working for Hector Aback on the Lotus 78. So you see there, Ronnie and Patrick, you see the chaos of the lack of the real organization of the podium and the interviews and everything else. But equally, you see the natural, you just see the natural touch and feel of motor racing. 
and the way Ronnie's got that Goodyear cap not really fitting very well. And you look at the way the drivers preen themselves today in front of the mirror or whatever in the pre-air, in the preamble to the, the podium and everything has to be perfect. And there's Ronnie and we've got the label sticking out the back somewhere. And Patrick de Paye looks like he's just desperate for a cigarette more than anything else. I just love it. And um, yeah, all you can say is different times, can't you? The uh, it was, you know, the, and the other thing about South Africa, which I used to love and which was symptomatic of that race was was the Kailami Ranch, which was at the bottom of the, the valley there below the circuit. And it had the swimming pool, the tennis courts, the chalets with the straw roofs, the beautiful restaurant. And that's where everybody was. And you just hung out there. And James Hunt wasn't there that year. I remember he stayed with friends, but everybody else was there. And, you know, you could actually be on a chaise long, a sunbather, by the pool with a stopwatch and you could time the cars going around the circuit in the distance at a certain point and you could do your lap charting from there almost and they played you know they played tennis they played backgammon they played table tennis they swam and that's where i you know that's where i got to know Jill so well and um, i really miss well i miss i mean it was was what it was and i'm just very lucky i think to have been around then and you saw me there on the grid um I always used to have a, a white um, Eton bag, which I was very proud of because it was Eton, as in the Carlos Reutemann personal sponsor. Eton was a big industrial company, but nobody else had this bag and I loved it. I don't know what I had in there. I think I had a lap chart, probably had a camera or two, um, a few other bits and bobs. But yeah, what a, what a wonderful time. Just brilliant. Loved it. Okay, um, so that was that one. 78 South African Grand Prix. I hope you enjoyed that one. Um, splendid footage. Um, jealous of you knowing Jill. Salut, Jill. Yeah, I mean, Jill was um, just, he was just a great guy. You know, we, we discovered that we had very similar birthdays and very similar, you know, outlook on life in many ways. And we just gelled immediately, particularly as I was so close to Carlos as well. And he and Carlos and Jill and Carlos became very good friends. And we just had a ball. And yeah, there wasn't a birthday of mine or his that went by when we didn't have a dinner together, which was invariably steak and chips, followed by ice cream with hot chocolate sauce. I mean, this was the Gilles Villeneuve diet of fitness and health. It was brilliant. <laughs> um, you know what, though? The last year of Gilles' life, 82, I remember going into the garage in Brazil and he had a, I think it was a tennis ball on a piece of string and he was doing this and he was following this tennis ball with his eyes not moving his head just with his eyes like this I said what are you doing Jill and he said oh, I'm exercising my eye muscles because I can feel that before long my eyesight might deteriorate a little bit and I just want to keep my eye muscles as absolutely as good as I possibly can and this is a very good way of doing it interesting isn't it um not sure that means anything, but I was very, I was a bit stunned by that, really. But equally, you know, we used to drive with Jill, not in South Africa very much, because it was such a short drive to the circuit, but uh, Brazil particularly and other circuits, um, Belgium actually, um, driving to the track with Jill was always something we did. It was just tradition, really. And you'd sit in the car and Jill's basic philosophy would be never stop, <laughs> regardless of a traffic light or traffic jams, never stop. And uh, handbrake turns with the thing. But he always had both hands on the wheel at any one time. And I remember him saying that uh, that was one of the first things he learned as a, as a driver of any sort, even in the snowmobile days, always have both hands on the wheel and never ever drive one-handed because you've always got to be ready for something going wrong and he true to his word you know apart from when he was handbraking he was always both hands on the wheel which um very different from ca reutemann who was no hands on the wheel most of the time just constantly looking out the window and doing other things he had a big had a pretty impressive shunt actually with carlos in the going to the i'm um, saying 74 probably it was it was the hockenheim german grand prix anyway 79 maybe He's in a Merc and we went off at the last minute. He noticed that that was the turning for Speyer to Hockenheim. We just did that to the wheel and we had a massive moment. And he did actually hit the right rear, and broke the rim, I remember, which is quite impressive. But then, you know, racing drivers are like that, aren't they? Um, yeah, <laughs> so there we are. Lots of memories. Um, Gilles, what a guy. Um, splendid footage, great to see. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to AP Archive. They're just um, 
Bronco Billy says, Peter, what was your proudest moment while working in Formula One or perhaps a contribution or project you were a part of? Well, you know what? It was actually, it was Nigel winning the World Championship in 92 because although I think a lot of people said at the time, led by Ayrton Senna, um, you know, anyone could win in that car. It's just a huge advantage and Nigel Mansell just happened to have lucked into it. I think anybody good could have won in that car, but we saw how much better Nigel was than Ricardo Petrezzi. That was the first thing. Secondly, um, Nigel, as I said before, I think deserved a year at least when he did have a great car because he had so many years without a great car, unlike Ayrton uh, and many other drivers, great drivers. So I wouldn't take that away from him at all. And then thirdly, I'm very lucky and privileged, I think, to have to have met a driver when he was nothing and nobody had heard of him or knew him or rated him and to believe in him 100% to the point where it basically consumed 15 years of my life and I just blinked and 15 years had passed. It was just one day of stress after another of how could I find money or get Nigel into a car or who could I influence to give Nigel an opportunity. I've just ate, slept, slept, drank Nigel Mansell with Carlos Reutemann kind of towards the end of his career. And I believed in Carlos the same way. And, and I was absolutely passionate about this. And I managed to get him into the Lotus through connections with David Phipps, Peter Collins, and um, well, basically that, and my own friendship with Colin Chapman, I guess. And then um, I managed to get him in the Formula 2 car through my relationship with David Phipps and Ron Toronac and the Ralph Formula 2 car. We got him into Lotus. And every race he did at Lotus, I was on tenterhooks because the car wasn't great. He was driving on the absolute limit beautifully, but it was obvious he was going to make mistakes being inexperienced. And every time he didn't come round, you know, my heart rate would go up to 190 or whatever. And there were moments when Colin had passed away and Peter Waugh was there and he obviously didn't like Nigel or rate him that highly. And he was very difficult to deal with. Just to give you one example, um, at the start of one year when Peter was running the team at Lotus, must have been, I guess it must have been 84. Um, Nigel had been asking Peter Waugh for some extra passes for, I think it was Long Beach because he had some friends in California and uh, or maybe another race I can't remember one of the first European races he'd given him plenty of warning or whatever and I remember I was having breakfast with Nigel at the at the hotel and Peter Wall came up and said oh hi Nigel hi Peter and he said um, he said right Nigel about the passes I've got good and bad news the good news is I've got some extra passes the bad news is you can't have any you know and, and that sort of that was that was what it was like for Nigel at Lotus in 84 not not pleasant at all. So that year I spent, I don't know how much time and effort trying to convince Frank Williams to sign Nigel, knowing that he wasn't going to keep his Lotus deal in 85. And the only chance perhaps was to get him in a Williams. So I just went on and on and on and on and on to Frank about it to the point where basically Frank just sort of said, oh, I've had enough of this. OK, yeah, let's give it a go. And that's how he got in. And so when from all of that, Nigel then won the World Championship, that was the best moment. It was a very flat moment in a way because I didn't get really get to see Nigel after the race. I was doing my other stuff as team manager of Williams at the time. Um, and there was never a moment when we sort of sat down and celebrated together. But personally speaking, I kind of felt that I had achieved something anyway, and I enjoyed it. And um, that moment probably will never, I and mean, I'm lucky to have experienced that because I don't think many people get the opportunity to experience things like that, to take a driver from nowhere and win the world championship because you believe in him from his talent and from his approach. More Nigel stories as we go on, if you're interested in them. Um, right, so it, it, Kyle Army, isn't that where the drivers hung out when boycotting the race? Yeah, it is indeed uh, Kyle Army Ranch where they hung out. So, uh, no, it wasn't actually in the ranch from memory. No, it was someplace near the circuit. It was an old dormitory though, where they went and hung out. And so that was um, that was a different place, but it was certainly Kalami. Uh, IndyCar is better on these days than Formula One. Like, where, well, I don't, I, I'm not going to say that. I mean, Formula One is still, for me, the pinnacle, and I still love watching it and trying to understand it. I understand much less about Formula One today than I did because 
we're not able to ask as many questions or get anything like the same answers that we used to get. But I do my best. That's all I can say. Um, did I ever go in a copter with Gilles as the pilot? No, never went with Gilles in a helicopter or in his powerboat, I'm pleased to say, because neither of them would I've enjoyed at all. But the car, I really did love doing that. Um, any anecdotes or funny stories that stand out on the Formula One press conferences you've moderated in the past? Um, not really. They're all pretty tense because you're working for FOM and everything's very, very, it's like a military operation there. And once you've got your headset on and the mic and everybody's waiting for the drivers to come in to the press conference room, you're very, you're very much in, you're in the control of everybody else. And so you're sitting there and waiting for the, the queue and everything else. Um, I suppose, you know, for me, those, if I think about them, the most enjoyable, not enjoyable, the most interesting bits about those press conferences with Michael, because very quickly it became clear to me that Michael is so competitive that even winning a press conference was important to him. And his idea of winning a press conference was to give away as little information as possible and to make the interview as short as possible. No information, short as possible. They were Michael's two things. And my goal always, which I guess Michael always knew, was to make it as long as possible and to ask as difficult, not as not difficult, but to try to get to the bottom of what had occurred, I guess. And so, yeah, I had, I had quite a lot of these things with Michael where I would say something. I, I got into the mode because I knew Michael, the minute you ask a question to which he can give a yes or no answer, he would always just say no or yes without saying any more, which is the worst thing you can do on television. So I always used to say, I always used to say something like, um, well, that strategy, although it looked odd going into the race, obviously worked out for you, Michael. But I just look at him. There was no question mark at the end of the statement. And I just look at him and it took quite a lot of not courage, I suppose is the wrong word, but it took quite a lot of, um, I don't know, bravery. Yeah, it was, you know, for me just to do nothing and wait for, 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 for Michael to speak. And I was doing that on the basis that Michael also knew this was live television going out globally, and he wasn't just gonna say nothing at all. So eventually he would have to speak, <clears throat> and you'd have to speak in terms of, excuse me, in terms of um, a sentence with a subject and a predicate, and it would have to be a proper self-contained sentence. So we did that quite a lot, and um, that was always quite good. The other, the other thing, it wasn't so much those press conferences, but it was afterwards when the bull ring, we, I used to go down and do uh, interviews there as well with all the sweaty journalists and the crews everywhere fighting and punching. And Michael, um, Michael always paid uh, a lot of, Michael was paid a lot of money to, to go to the German TV first and then everybody else would get second treatment. <laughs> and I remember once I was delayed. I, th I don't know what I was doing. It was something else for FOM, I guess, up in the main press conference thing. And I was late down and my cameraman, Jimbo Foley, mega guy, big FOM cameraman, I was standing there. Um, and Michael obviously knew subliminally that he was my cameraman worked with me and um, as he walked past he saw Jimbo but I wasn't there and he said what are you doing here he said to Jimbo and Jimbo said well oh, I'm here with with Peter Windsor and he said well he's not here is he get away and Jimbo said I'm not getting away Michael and he said yeah get away and, and they had this big argument and fight um, and Jimbo wouldn't go of course and then I turned up and Michael begrudgingly came in but you know I always got on well with Michael in a funny sort of way we got on well and um when he when he retired first time round, which is his real retirement in my view, the whole Mercedes thing was a mistake. But his real retirement when he left Formula One, driving for Ferrari, I got him to sign my pass in the last race, as you do with the World Champions. Usually, but I got Michael to sign it, and um, and it just said something like to Peter. I think he wrote to Peter, keep it up or something like that. And we just looked at one another, and he just went like that, and. Um, that meant a lot to me, actually. So, Michael, I miss him a lot. I'm a bit teary-eyed thinking about Michael because I miss him massively. Um, and that's why, you know, it's another reason. That's why I'd love to see Mick Schumacher be given a real chance. I know a lot of people out there be saying, oh, Mick Schumacher. I tell you what, if the guy is given an opportunity in which he has his own confidence and can build his own way, he will deliver. I really like Mick. And he's an amazing star. He's just a star, isn't he? And and if he was in a Ferrari, wow, that would be great for Formula One. Um, 
Uh, Gilles driving to the track. Yeah, yeah, it happened. Yeah, many times, actually. A golden era of the 80s. Well, I think so. I mean, you may wonder why I'm choosing so many videos from that period. The answer is that's where most of the AP archive videos are from that era. Um, we've got one more to come, actually. But um, do you think we'll ever see an IndyCar driver come over to Formula One? We touched on this before. It's difficult for them to give up everything they've got going. You need to get good Americans before they commit to either NASCAR or IndyCar, bring them over, good ones, give them a real opportunity in F3, F2, F1, and then you definitely have an American winning races in Formula One. There are plenty of talents out there. Um, Logan Sargent is a guy that I'm watching at the moment. Um, we've got Cameron Daz in Formula Three as well. It's, and there are others that I'm not mentioning, but you know, it breaks my heart also that there aren't more Americans around in Formula One, or certainly in, in the route to Formula One, because they're so good at it. Um, is Verstappen a once in a generation talent? Well, I don't think he's any more of a talent than Lewis. So I don't think you'd say he's the only driver of this generation or Charles for that matter. But I think Charles, Lewis, Max, what a trio we have there. And obviously at some point Lewis won't be racing and those two will uh, because they're younger. And uh, then we got that great era to look forward to. <clears throat> Um, since you got close ties with Williams, can you offer any insight as to what happened last year at Williams with Paddy Lowe? Um, show it to us, please. What's that, Mark? Forgotten what that was. But anyway, um, that's another story, really. But Paddy, I still rate Paddy very highly. I don't think he was used well by Williams. I think he was miscast. I don't think he got what he needed to do the job there. Still an amazing talent in terms of, you look at his results, what he's achieved at Mercedes, McLaren and Williams. And in that first time around at Williams. And... Uh, I would still use him on any project that I was doing. I think he's incredible. Really nice guy, thinks well, very good brain, no ego at all. Um, I'm staggered, really, that Williams couldn't get the best from him, to be honest. But, you know, Williams such a funny team with the whole Lawrence Stroll thing and the way it's run at the moment. And it's getting better, as I said in the last show. Two very good drivers. They can't fail but to do better than they did last year. But... Um, you know, it saddens me when I see guys like Paddy not being used well. In the same way that McLaren didn't use Honda very well. Uh, very similar thing. You've, it's no good just plugging in these things and assuming they're going to work. In the same way that um, you know, Jacques Villeneuve tried to make BAR work with Craig Pollock, just plugged in lots of good people, put in lots of money. Ah, we've got a great Grand Prix team. Because it's not about that. It's about organic growth. And it's about building blocks. And it's about learning every day as you go along with people and with with data and, and content and, in, and information. And that never happened. It doesn't happen when you try to do quick fix teams. And we've seen a lot of them over the years from Beatrice Ford, most recently, um, obviously to the way the money was spent at Williams in the Stroll era. Right, I've got one more video and then I think we should call it a night. Um, this is a very short one, but this is an interesting one. Hopefully you've not seen it before. I certainly hadn't. And, and it's only because it was such an unusual thing that I want to show this video. This is Jackie Stewart winning a Formula One race in a Lotus. This is the 1964 Rand Grand Prix held at the back end of 64 at Kyle Army, interestingly enough. So you'll see a big contrast between the Kyle Army of 64 and the Kyle Army of 78 in terms of curbs, runoff air, etc. No catch fencing those days either. And um, it, it's to put this one into context. Jim Clark has just done a Ford promotion in Cortina, Italy, uh, on a, around the Lotus Cortina. And they ran a Lotus Cortina down one of the bobsled runs. Anyway, Jimmy, in the festivities afterwards, which involved John Whitmore and a few others, slipped a disc in his back and couldn't do this race. He, only, he was only just fit enough to do the South African Grand Prix at the beginning of 65. Uh, a few weeks later, but this one he stood down. And so Colin Chapman put Jackie Stewart in Jimmy's car for this Rand Grand Prix, which is a non-championship Formula One race at Kyle Army. Jackie had driven the Lotus 33 once before in the middle, oddly, of the 64 British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch during the lunch break. Jackie went out and did a few laps in the Lotus. They just allowed you to do things like that in those days. So he knew the car a little bit, but it was really the first time he'd driven it in anger. His teammate was Mike Spence, so Lotus had two cars there. And Jackie qualified easily on the pole, three or four tenths quicker than Mike Spence. And you know what? I've got this wrong. I'm going to run the Monaco Grand Prix next. I'm so sorry about this. Let's run. We're going to swap orders. We'll continue with this story now, and then we'll finish this whole thing with the Monaco Grand Prix from another year. So, sorry, we'll continue with the Rand Grand Prix. And um, Mike Spence should have won 
easily, actually, but he didn't because he let Graham Hill get near him and pass him in the first heat and Graham Hill won the won the event overall. Jackie Stewart breaks a drive shaft in the first heat. It was a two-part race. So the field swarms around him. And that first heat is won by Graham Hill in the Wilmot Brabham, which he started from the back of the grid. The second heat, Jackie Stewart leads from, leads from the back of the grid to win. Sorry, I'm a bit confused here, but only because I was thinking we should have run the Monaco Grand Prix, so we're slightly out of order. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, bottom line is, in the history of Formula One, and let's include non-championship races, I cannot think of another occasion in a two-part race when the two winners are different and they both started from the back of the grid. That's what happened in the RAN Grand Prix. Anyway, let's run it now. The 1964 RAN Grand Prix from South Africa. There's the poster. There's Jackie in the Lotus Series. Jim Endrowite, uh, last minute instructions, taps Jackie on the helmet. Mike Spence is next to him. There's Mike telling the fans to get off the grid. Uh, and then Jackie blows forward and then the drive shaft breaks and the whole field swarms around him. And Broush Neiman in a Lotus 22 um, has a big moment. You can see him going actually backwards there. He goes on to finish fifth overall, despite being very badly burnt in a testing accident as well. Jackie's 33 is pushed off the grid. Mike Spence is now leading this first part quite easily. Graham Hill's at the back of the grid because he didn't practice the parts arrive late for his Wilman Brabham, but he works his way up through the field, catches Mike by surprise and wins the first heat from Mike Spence, which was obviously not a great thing. There's Tony Maggs in the pits. He qualified third, but didn't start because of an engine problem. And now it's difficult to tell which, which heat this is, but I'm assuming now we're in the second heat and we've got Jackie Stewart driving through the field to catch Graham Hill, who finishes second in the second heat and Jackie wins the second heat overall. But the, the overall winner is indeed Graham Hill as he takes a checkered flag here in the Wilmot Brabham. And a very, very good second is Paul Hawkins in a Formula Two Wilmot Brabham. So it was a one, two for Wilmot. Paul Hawkins drove beautifully. It was on the back of that drive that he got his chance to race the Lotus 33 in Formula One. So that was the Rang Grand Prix. And now without any more ado, let's move on to the, to the one I should have been showing you, which is the 1970, Monaco Grand Prix, just like the Rang Grand Prix, or just like the 78 South African Grand Prix, the lead changed on the last lap. Jack Brabham was leading the race easily. Jochen Rint got closer and closer and closer to, to Brabham, but Jack knew that Jochen was never going to pass him because it's impossible at Monaco unless he really made a big mistake. And so he was just letting Jochen get within a couple of seconds and was going to win the Grand Prix. But as they came down to the last corner, the stage, the gasworks hairpin, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. It's where Rascas is now, but it was just a direct hairpin then. Jack was coming up to lap Piers Courage's Delara, Di Tommaso, designed by Delara, which is going very slowly. And Jack was a bit unsure whether to pass him on the left or the right because Piers was in the middle of the road. He went down the inside, which was full of marbles and very, very slippery. He went down the inside, locked up and went straight on into the straw bales as a result of which Jochen just went straight past and won the race. But what really annoyed Jack was that as he was putting the car into reverse very quickly to get back into the race, a marshal had jumped over the straw bales to try to help and tripped and landed right on the top of Jack's car, which delayed Jack for another, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds. So Jochen Rint eventually won this 1970 Monaco Grand Prix. He won it, you could say, very luckily because of what happened to Jack, but he had put a massive amount of pressure on Jack. And think about this pole position for this race, Jackie Stewart in the Tyrrell March, this is 1970 when they're running marches, 1 minute 24-0. The next time, I think it was Chris Amon, 24-5 or 6, Chris had had a problem in practice, actually been held up by Pedro Rodriguez and was so annoyed, was waving his fist. And as he waved his fist, he hit the guardrail. Won't do that again. Um, but in the chase of Jack, Jochen Rint's last two laps, 123.3, 123.2, 3, 3, 0.8 quicker than Jackie Stewart's pole lap. That's how on the limit Jochen Rint was in those last few, <clears throat> last few laps of the 70 Monaco Grand Prix. So here we are, Monaco, 1970. Graham Hill, five times winner, driving the Rob Walker Lotus 49. He would finish fifth in this Grand Prix, a very good performance in the autumn of his career. There it is, there's the Rob Walker car. Dark blue, looked very nice. Nice sign writing. There are the two Yardley BRM P153 V12s designed by Tony Southgate 
beautiful cars. Jack Oliver and Pedro Rodriguez. Pedro would win the Belgian Grand Prix in a few weeks' time. There's the there's the Piers Courage de Tommaso with the Cosworth engine. Oddly, Piers there with an Alfa Romeo sticker on his uh, logo on his overalls. That's because he was driving sports cars for Alphas and had the same set of overalls for both. There's the Tyrrell March, which got the pole for Jackie. There's Jackie looking very Jackie. And there's the crowd waiting for the start, and, and it's Chris Amon actually leads in the middle. The Jack down the inside there, and the Brabham and Jackie Stewart on the outside. Uh, Gets a good run and does actually get the lead into Sandovote. Chris Amon there, Jack Brabham. Jack passes Chris quite early on, but Chris doesn't let him get away. Jackie retires early in the race. Uh, there's Jackie Ix leading Denny Harmon. Henri Pescarolo, who went really well in the Matra MS120 V12. He won the Formula 3 race there in 67. Knows Monaco really well. There's Jochen Rint chasing that group, Harmon and Pescarolo out of Sandovote. Hasn't changed much there. There's Jackie. There's Graham in the 49, looking good. And this is what the race lead was all about. Jack Brabham with Chris Amon driving beautifully right behind him in the unwieldy March 701, the factory car, the 701 STP car. Pescarado leading a group. There's Jack again out of the chicane. Chris still there. And there's, I think that's Jackie Oliver in the uh, B12 BRM looking nice. Might have been Pedro, difficult to tell. Uh, the journalist in the media center. Ha ha. Now, the flagman was so astonished by Jack not winning that he didn't actually wave the checker for Jochen. But there's Jochen on the podium now with Princess Grace, Prince Rainier holding the trophy. Some nice shots here just as he comes down the steps. The camera stays on him a bit, and you get a little bit of a feel for Gold Leaf Team Lotus in 1970. They're still in the 49. Of course, Jochen would be racing the 72 at Zandvoort. But uh, a lovely, lovely win for Jochen Rind, if you take into account those amazing laps that he put in. So sorry about the slight um, forgetfulness on my side of the order in which you're running things, but got it right in the end, ran Grand Prix and then Monaco. Some uh, amazing stuff there, I think. You, hopefully you'll agree. We'll have plenty more of that next week. And don't forget, we'll be putting out short edits from uh, this show all around those videos, plus perhaps a few other comments uh, over the next few days. Thank you for supporting the show. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And all details of uh, Richard Noble's book will be in the description of this video when it comes out on YouTube as well. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Mm -hmm.